These skies have looked down on us over times of war, famine, and desperation, but they've also seen humans celebrate the longest peacetime Europe has ever known, inspired music, poetry, and art, and filled our hearts and soul with wonder, awe, and magic. To look to the stars is to know we are not alone. To look to the stars is to know we have a past, but we also have a future. Hi, I'm Ruskin Hartley, Executive Director of the International Dark Sky Association. And these were the words of Danny Robinson, one of our supporters at Cisnodonia Dark Sky Reserve in the United Kingdom. During these unprecedented times, few things bring us together like the night sky. Today, we're going to discuss the value of the night, how it is threatened by light pollution, and how you can take simple steps to ensure the night is there for all of us. We often think that the night is more alive and more richly coloured than the day. Those are the words of Vincent van Gogh. And too many of us have forgotten this and assumed the night is dark, when it is actually alive with light. Here's a picture one of our colleagues, Bebek Tafreshi, took recently in Oman, a part of the world I spent some time 20 years ago, um, actually camped down by these beaches and enjoyed swimming in the bioluminescent ocean, just to wonder at the beautiful blue light with the stars above. So the International Dark Sky Association has for the last 30 years been working to protect the night from light pollution around the world through our network of volunteers and supporters on every continent apart from Antarctica. Today we're going to talk a little bit about what is light pollution, why should you care, and how can you help solve it. So first, what is light pollution? Put it simply, it's wasted light. It's light that's not needed comes in three main forms. Glare. Here's a picture I took recently in Washington, D.C. of uh, what is colloquially referred to as a glare bomb. Um, many of you driving around at night will have seen the bright blue headlights from these new cars, you know, blinding us, causing physical discomfort in some times. So glare is really uh, an immediate cause of light, source of light pollution and something that's very obvious to many of us. The second is light trespass. This is really light going beyond where it's needed. Here's a, a great example of a street light. Um, maybe needed to, to light the, 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 the pathway for pedestrians at night, but do you really need it shining in your bedroom? All of those residents there, if they don't have blackout blinds, they, their rooms are gonna be awash with light. They can probably read the newspaper at midnight from those street lights. And the third and probably the most complex is sky glow. This is really the net contribution and combination of all those individual sources of light over our cities. This is a, a picture uh, from Los Angeles and you can see it dimly in the distance. You can see the, the downtown lights and, and you can just see that the whole city is awash with lights. And for many of us who live in the urban areas, this is the norm. Um, the light from these cities, these individual light sources, millions of sources, doesn't stay in these cities. In fact, sky glow can propagate hundreds of miles. It doesn't know borders. But why should you care? Why should anyone care about sky glow given everything else that's going on? Why should you care about light pollution? Well, for this crowd, clearly one of the reasons is about astronomy. Since 1608, we've been gazing at the sky through telescopes. Each generation of astronomers has pushed our frontier of knowledge both forwards and backwards in time and helped us deepen our understanding of both the universe and what it means to be human. Light pollution is like throwing a veil over the sky and robs us of that understanding. But over the last 30 years, the dark sky movement has moved far beyond its initial roots in the astronomy community and engages a broad array of constituents. People who care about wildlife, about animals, should care about light pollution. Many animal species around the world are active at night. 100% of bats, 90% of amphibians, and we estimate 70% of mammals. Light pollution disturbs the habitat, disrupts behavior, and leads to death. Here in Arizona, the iconic saguaro cactus is pollinated at night by nectar-feeding bats, birds, and insects, including this beautiful lesser long-nosed bat. Birds are like moths in that they're attracted to light. They also, also migrate using celestial navigation. They see the patterns in the stars. Unfortunately, they're also drawn to the sky glow caused by cities. 
had become disoriented in the bright lights. There is data to estimate that up to 100 million to 1 billion birds die in the US alone from light pollution each year. Insects are a vital pollinator at the base of our food chain, often overlooked, commonly neglected, and if you're my son, <laughs> they run away from them and they say, oh, there's a bug. The scientists recently warned that 400,000 insect species currently face extinction. There are a myriad causes, pesticides, habitat loss, but also light pollution. What sets light pollution apart is it's relatively easy to solve. Trees and plants are also affected by light pollution. Those exposed to artificial light at night bud earlier, lose their leaves later, and have shorter lifespans. You can see in this picture the distribution of the uh, leaves turning into fall is affected by the street light over the top of them. Where the street lights on at night, the plant, the tree, still thinks it's summer. It also impacts our health. More and more, we're understanding that humans are like any other species. I was recently at a meeting in Boston with a sleep biologist there, a sleep professor, who said basically humans are as, as sensitive to light as cockroaches. We have evolved, as all life has on this planet, with this predictable rhythm of night and day, with the rhythm of the moon, the rhythm of the stars. And our circadian rhythm, our very body clock, is aligned with that. Artificial light at night, electric night at night, disrupts that, and we're starting to understand how that is contributing to many of the ills and diseases and challenges of, of modern society. Um, Large-scale epidemiological studies in Israel and Spain indicate that areas with high levels of light at night are also areas that have high levels of, of cancer and other, other human diseases. We're a long way from being able to say an exact dose of light causes an exact response, but the evidence is mounting. Dark skies also connect us to our ancestors. It's really the cultural heritage of dark skies is important to what it means to be human. The people who built Chaco Canyon in New Mexico were expert star watchers and aligned their structures with the stars. When I was down in New Zealand, I met with Maori navigators who had journeyed in the footsteps of their ancestors from the South Island of New Zealand to Hawaii, navigating by the stars. I also met recently with an IDA member who said, did you know when he was in the, uh, in the military, they were still training uh, the B-52 bombers to navigate by the stars. Dark skies are also critical and important for economic development. Here's an example from New Zealand. New Zealand's stargazing and hot cup pools in Tekapo on the South Island. Rural communities are discovering one way that they can diversify their economy is by protecting their dark skies. And people, because these are so unusual these days, are seeking them out. They're coming from all over the world to experience a truly dark sky. And there's also the matter of cost savings. Light pollution, as any other pollution, is simply waste. Reduce the waste, you save money. We estimate that three to seven billion dollars each year in the US alone is spent on unneeded light. That burns and wastes, we estimate, 21 million tons of carbon dioxide contributing to global warming. So what's the current status of light pollution and dark skies here in the US and around the world? It is clear that light pollution is a global issue. Many of you might have seen this map published in Science Advances in 2016. It mapped light pollution around the world. And you can see the, the bright spots there of Europe, of Eastern US, and, and basically anywhere there are people. Essentially, light pollution tracks population density and economic density, although there are some, some important variations that we're just starting to learn about. We estimate that 80% of people on the planet live under a polluted sky. And the annual rate of increase of light pollution is 2%. Most shockingly for me, there are some estimates that of those people who live under a polluted sky, only 1% know that they're missing anything. 
This is a simple chart to key you into a couple of these maps. You can see on the left, that's really the sky from inner city, inner city. That's the sky with a veil thrown over it, a deep veil. A veil that blocks out almost every single star. Perhaps you can see the moon, perhaps Venus when it's bright, but that's about all it. And on the right, that's becoming increasingly rare. That's a truly dark sky. When you go out, you might see 5,000 stars. And you can see this transition, this gradation in the middle. And many of us here, I'm fortunate in Southern Arizona, and many of the people watching, live under those blue skies, those rural skies, those rural and transitional skies, where we still get to step outside our door at night, particularly in the summer, and see the Milky Way. So what about the situation here in the US? And, and this is really, again, a, a map that tracks by and large population growth. And you, you can see uh, the line in the middle of the continent there um, with the dense population to, to the east and the light pollution growing. Really, over the last 50 years, we have essentially lost all of the naturally dark places in the east of the US. Now, fortunately, in the west, we have the opportunity to protect and hang on to those critically dark reserves particularly out in Nevada, Oregon, here in Arizona, uh, and through up through the continent up, up into the northern part. Now we've drawn the map in closer to southern Arizona, uh, to the area around Phoenix and, and Tucson, where many of us live. In, in fact, I live, if I can do this, right here on the edge of town, right by Swallow East National Park. In fact, if I look west, I see the light dome of Tucson. If I look east, I can still see a dark sky. And in the summer, on a clear night, when there's no moon, I can look up and I can see the Milky Way overhead. But you can see here in southern Arizona, there continue to be critical areas of natural darkness. Our challenge for all of us in the coming years is as population continues to grow, and let's hope as the economy starts to recover from the current crisis it's in, that we can manage these light domes, we can manage these areas so that we can continue to protect these critically dark places, both for the value they bring to our economy through the astronomical community, but also the value they bring to, for, for wildlife and for people and for just the enjoyment that we have of the darkness here in southern Arizona. Fortunately, light pollution actually has a simple solution. We like to think of it about community-friendly lighting. The myth is that more light is safer. I want to bust that myth. More light does not make you safe. Did you see that person hiding in the shadows? The glare from that unshielded bright fixture closed our pupils down. We could not see the individual standing there in plain view. Everyone knows that shadows are cast when there's bright light, and it is a classic example of that. The reality is that well-designed lighting is what makes us safer. So at IDEA, we recently came up with a set of simple principles to help anyone who wants to be part of the, the solution rather than part of the problem. The five principles when you're thinking about lighting that you should always keep in mind. The first, most importantly, is, is there a use for the light? Arguably, the only truly dark sky friendly light is the one that's never installed. So before you install a light, think about why do I have it there? Do I need it? Are there other ways I'd accomplish the same goals? Is the light targeted? Light pointed down on the ground is what we generally need. Our name is the International Dark Sky Association, not the Dark Ground Association, but it's all too common for lights to be pointed up into the sky where the light is simply wasted. We like to think about low light levels. There's a it's chronic over lighting of many of our cities something that we all get used to and no one really knows, notices. But what we're more learning more and more is that actually our eyes are remarkably adaptable to low light levels. Now, if you think about it, if you go outside on a dark night when the moon is out, you can get around perfectly well. That's about 0 0.3 lux. It's very little light, but our eyes are able to adapt to those, those low levels. When we start to introduce brighter levels into the environment, it almost becomes a, a, a kind of a, a, a war of a, attrition. Every, everyone needs brighter and our eyes adapt to those brighter levels. So we need more and more and more. That's what we need to turn the clock on. We also need to put controls in place. We need to make sure that if you have a security light, that it's on when it spots motion and five minutes later, it turns back on. 
more and more we can introduce dimmers and other types of controls on it so that we can dim these lights down at night. I put some on a, some patio lights that I have at, at home, I can dim them to 25% at the touch of a button. And lastly, we like to think about the color characteristics of light. You can see in this picture here, which actually a Tucson, the sort of warm glow. Fire that tends to look warmer, more like fires or candle lights, tends to have less short wavelength emissions. And it's those short wavelength emissions that are harmful to sky glow, that harm wildlife, and more and more we're learning are also impactful for human health. The good news is that there are some great examples of cities coming together to reduce light pollution. In fact, one is here in Tucson, where IDA staff collaborated with people in the city of Tucson where, when they converted nearly 20,000 streetlights from high pressure sodium lights to modern LED lights. These lights operate at 90% brightness uh, before midnight, and at midnight they actually drop down to 60%. These have resulted in some real savings. <clears throat> we have reduced the overall lumens, that's the amount of light being put into the environment, by 63%. We have reduced the amount of blue light, that's the short wavelength emissions from the legacy high pressure sodium systems, by 34%. And critically to the city mothers and fathers, we are delivering $2.1 million in annual savings through reduced energy use every year. But there's another aspect of the energy savings. By dimming these lights, we're extending the life of these fixtures. And we estimate these fixtures might go from anywhere from originally eight years, if they're running full, 100% all the time, to 25 years. So you can see that by implementing these principles of good lighting principles, responsible lighting principles, we're able to create a beautiful environment for people that protects wildlife, reduces sky glow, and saves money. The other part of this solution is to raise awareness of the wonder of the night. Too many people are scared of the dark. They think the dark is dark. They don't realize that the dark is full of light. This is me the other evening. You know, it doesn't look dark, but the cameras are so sensitive these days with, with my son Beckett. We dragged the telescope out and, and we looked through it at the moon. Um, many people have never seen the moon through a telescope. Being able to look at the craters of the moon and, and imagine people walking on there 50 years ago and now really puts us in perspective. And my son now, whenever he goes out, he pretty much can spot the moon, which is special. I wanted to close with another quote from one of our members that we received in recent days. The night sky gives us hope. It lets us see something stunningly beautiful during this moment of crisis and reminds us how we are all connected under the same vast and wonderful night sky, working together as brothers and sisters to come over this worldwide catastrophe. That's Andrew Gutierrez from Guatemala. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for spending some time. And thank you for doing your part um, to engage people with the beauty of the night and to help us all take the simple steps to protect that. Thank you.